Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our February lecture on February 28th. Um, this month it passed in February, February 11th, I believe, the Luzerne County Historical Society celebrated its 165th anniversary or birthday, our birthday, February 11th. And next month is Women's History Month. And our speaker for Women's History Month is going to be Andrea Lowry. Andrea is the executive director at the Pennsylvania Historic and Museum Commission and a descendant, Mark. I'm not sure exactly how she's related, but she's going to speak about her ancestor, Ellen Webster Palmer. Um, Ellen Webster Palmer um, was an advocate for boys to improve the lives of child laborers, especially the breaker boys. So we are looking forward to an excellent presentation by Andrea. On May 11th, we are going to have our annual dinner at the River Street Jazz Cafe in Plains. And we are going to be talking about a Wilkes-Barre native, Lyman Howe who put sound to motion pictures for the first time. So he's the predecessor to when we go to the movies now and hear people talking, he was the one that did the music along with the pictures, the moving pictures. So that should be a great event. And I look forward to seeing everybody there. Mark, it's your turn. Okay, yeah, so we've got a lot of good things coming up uh, the next couple of months. Uh, definitely stay tuned to our Facebook page our Instagram, our uh, website. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We have a you know, bunch of different places where you could follow us. And newspapers have been very good to us. They always print our stuff as well. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, likewise, you know, you're on here. You already know we are recording this. This is going to go up on our YouTube channel. We're going to give uh, John and the Anthracite Museum a copy. Uh, you know, they can distribute it at uh, their various sites as well. So if you have anybody that missed it, or if you know something happens and you drop the connection or something, don't panic. You'll be able to see it. Uh, it should probably, hopefully, be edited and up tomorrow. If not tomorrow, definitely Thursday. There's usually not too much editing we have to do for these, so uh, you know, don't panic. Uh, you'll be able to see it. Your friends will be able to see it. What have you? Uh, I'm pleased tonight to have with us uh, John Fielding. He's he's our speaker this evening. He's the curator at the Anthracite Heritage Museum just up the road a little bit in Scranton. And, you know, hey, Lackawanna County used to be Luzerne County, so it, it all ties together. And we're thrilled to uh, partner with the Anthracite Heritage Museum as an institution and with John as an individual again. He's been up there, it's got to be at least two decades, because I've been here 15 years and you were there a while before I was there. So it's got to be at least two decades in one form or another. Uh, he's actually the one you can blame for me. He got me started way, 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 way back when on my, you know, inevitable road to whatever it is I'm doing today. And so it's, when we were here at the Luzerne County Historical Site anyway, we get a lot of questions about Edgar Patience, obviously. He's a famous local uh, artist. Don't want to give too much of the presentation away. Uh, but we also get a lot of questions about things that are more modern, 50s, 60s, 70s. And so this is a great opportunity to sort of touch on two things. It is still African American History Month because it is February. We just made it February 28th. And it is also a local artist. We had some research about a different local artist today I was looking up. And it is also more modern. You know, the, the 60s, the 70s might not seem modern. Uh, but when you're a historian, that's pretty recent. The vast majority of the work we do is much later than that. And we're very lucky because, you know, a lot of his work is in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's in museums in Canada. It's in the, you know, the Mack Truck Museum. But we have a fantastic collection just up the road. The Anthracite Heritage Museum has a fantastic collection of his work. They have a fantastic number of resources on his work. We have several of his books, uh, or our books on him, rather. Dr. Moss is here today. We have her book. The Anthracite Museum has her book. Uh, we have a few other ones. So uh, it's nice to be able to touch on something that a lot of people do ask us about and that does sort of touch on a more modern timeline. But at the same time, you don't have to go to Washington to look at his items. 
You could just go to Scranton because John has a bunch of them and he's going to tell you about them right now. So before I ramble anymore, I'm going to turn it over to our speaker this evening, John Fielding. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm really uh, glad to be here tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk, uh, as Mark said, about the artwork of Sierger Patients in uh, our collection. Uh, I'm going to go over a little bit of how he started, uh, how he got his start um, in the coal souvenir business, then progressed into uh, being an artist. And uh, I'm going to go a little bit into his, his family genealogy. But before I do that, I, I want to uh, I want to recognize uh, his his daughter, uh, Dr. Juanita Mo Patience Moss, uh, who is with us tonight. Uh, a lot of our information that we have uh, actually came from uh, Dr. Moss, and uh, you know I'm glad she's here tonight. Uh, when I was an intern uh, back in the early 2000s, um, I was an intern under uh, our curator. Uh, at the time, Chester Colessa, and uh, I had the uh, the privilege at, at that time to travel to uh, Sieger's house and on 82 Loomis Street uh, at his house. It was the house of him and his wife, uh, Alice Marie. And uh, I had a, the opportunity to go there and uh, see, actually see uh, the workshop that Sieger patients worked in and, and get to talk to uh, Dr. Dr. Moss. So I'm I'm really glad that, that you showed up tonight. Thank you very much. I'm honored. Uh, I'm also thankful for all of the uh, the donations that uh, have come in through the years. Our most recent donation uh, of Sieger patients items was in 2005. So uh, Dr. Moss, I have, a, I have a question for you though before I begin. So there's a couple points. Uh, I was going to tell some uh, stories that you had reiterated in your in your book. Um, that you wrote, but uh, if if I think it would would be better for you um, to reiterate some of these stories instead of me doing it, since you're here, would you mind doing that or or no? It depends on what you want me to say. Uh, well, if there was one, there's one section I just want. Uh, I was going to talk about his uh, his workshop and and the uh, how dirty it was and dusty. And in your yes. book, you you describe how he goes to, uh, you know, to work every day and, and the clothing that he wore. Um, so at that point in time, would you remind, would, would you mind talking about that when I get to that in my presentation? <laughs> oh, okay, I'll hold on. Yes, okay. <laughs> if you don't mind, I mean, I could, I could reiterate it. You ask me and then I'll tell you what you ask me. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, I'm gonna share my screen and then uh, I guess we'll begin. Can everybody see uh, my presentation? Yes, yes we can. So tonight, uh, as I mentioned, I'm gonna talk about the art of Sieger Patients. Uh, Charles Edgar Patients was uh, the, uh, well, he was an African-American sculptor of <clears throat> anthracite coal. He is the most prominently known anthracite coal sculptor. There were other uh, sculptors of anthracite coal most recently, uh, a man named Frank Magdalinsky, who recently passed away. Frank mm -hmm. Magdalinsky, ironically, he also learned how to cult, sculpt coal, well, actually his father did, from uh, the patient's family as well. So there is that connection there, that, that generational connection. Charles Edgar Patience, seen here, was born August 27th, 1906, in West Pittsburgh. Uh, he later moved to Wilkes-Barre, PA, where he set up uh, a shop to, uh, to craft coal. He learned the business of making and selling coal souvenirs from his father, Harry B. Patience. Sieger Patience, however, he wasn't really satisfied in remaining in his work of crafting coal souvenirs. He saw the beauty in the dusty, cheap fuel of anthracite that was really abundant and taken for granted within this region. So... Through the sculpting process of carving, scoring, sanding, and polishing coal, he revealed what he believed was the true beauty of anthracite to the world. Despite the financial risks of abandoning the souvenir business, C. Edgar began to work as an artist in the medium of anthracite in the 1950s. Two factors would come into play in the, into the significance of C. Edgar's work. 
Uh, one uh, is the decline of the anthracite industry. So as he was emerging as an artist from the souvenir business, the anthracite industry was also declining. And, uh, and second was actually the civil rights movements of the 1950s and 60s. His artistic works reflect a duality connecting his African roots to his American and anthracite region heritage. His works would later be exhibited in numerous museums as well as uh, works commissioned by Queen Juliana of the Netherlands, the government of Barbados, and Presidents Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon. So I'm gonna go over a little bit of background about uh, the patient's family right now. So his, uh, he can trace his roots back to uh, his grandfather, uh, Crowder Pachon, who was uh, an escaped, he escaped enslavement in Louisiana during the Civil War and later joined the 103rd PA Volunteer Regiment. Uh, this regiment was, a, uh, was actually an all white regiment. So he was an African-American in this, this all white regiment. They uh, actually went, uh, you know, they, he served through the duration of the Civil War and was mustered out in Harrisburg in 1865. In 1877, uh, Crowder and his wife, Elise, moved to Pittston, where he became a caretaker farmer uh, for the Carpenter family greenhouse. Apparently, they, they put him up in a, uh, in a house. Uh, you know, he was allowed to live there. They, they kind of, uh, you know, gave him a job. He did really well. And it was at that time that his uh, second child, Harry B., uh, Harry Brigier, patient, seen pictured here on this slide, was born. Now, Harry, like most boys in the anthracite region, uh, he did not uh, get to graduate high school. So he had an eighth grade education. And at that point in time, usually in the anthracite region, about the time boys were 12, 13, 14 years old, they usually had to go to work in the, uh, in the coal mines. Uh, in this case, Harry becomes a breaker boy at the Exeter Colliery in Exeter where he spends uh, the next several years. But on January 15th, 1896, he's injured at the age of 19. And uh, we have a, just a little copy from the uh, 1896 mine inspector's reports uh, that outlines his injury right here. And it basically reads January 15th, Harry Patient was a laborer. It lists his age as 17, but if he was born in 1877, he would have been 19 at that point in time. So the mine inspector's reports actually do make a lot of typographical errors uh, that I've noticed over the years. And uh, he was listed as single. That's what the S means. Uh, he was injured at the Exeter Breaker in Exeter. And they listed his accident as uh, arm painfully squeezed by having been caught in conveyors. And uh, it was really that accident that ended his, his mining career and started him on the trajectory of carving coal. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of breaker boys, uh, door tenders, and even some laborers, as in the case of Harry, they had some downtime while working in the mines. Machinery had to be fixed or uh, you know, belts had to be repaired, things like that. And uh, so sometimes it was downtime. During that downtime, a lot of uh, breaker boys and, and other uh, mine workers actually learned how to occupy their time by whittling. So a lot of them had pocket knives and they would grab you know, scraps of wood. They would start carving uh, shapes out of those wood, little figurines or, or trinkets, et cetera. And, uh, so Harry, Harry knew how to carve, he carved wood, but he also used that time to practice carving on coal. And that is a skill that he learned when he was a breaker boy that projected him into his career. Eventually, uh, Harry would get married and uh, to uh, Elise, they would get married and move to 34 Washington Street in West Pittston. Uh, on this screen at the top, we do have a business card from Harry B. Patients and Sons. Uh, once again, a lot of these photos uh, actually come from uh, Juanita. So thank you very much for, for sharing those photos. And um, so down, down at the bottom, we have uh, a picture of Harry B. 
and uh, hit some of his children. So all six sons of Harry and Elise would participate in the coal souvenir business. They all learned the process. They all acquired that skill. And uh, the six sons, Robert, Kenneth, Wilmer, Edgar, Bruce, and Harold L. Now, Harold is the only one not in this photo. Uh, he is in the photo to the right because he was too young in 1918. Uh, there's also uh, Percy here. And Percy, I believe, is a, uh, a brother of Harry B. So there, pretty much the whole patient's family at one point in time participated in this family business. They produced uh, a variety of items, souvenirs, jewelry, uh, et cetera, but it was a very kind of competitive business. Unlike today, where there are very few coal crafters, uh, back then there were uh, maybe half a dozen to a dozen throughout the region. And because of that, there was more competition. Prices were kind of kept low because of that competition. So profit margins were actually kind of tight. And uh, so to to make an you know to make a living uh, was kind of difficult. And unfortunately, in 1926, Harry B dies from a stroke. Uh, because of that competition, uh, the the low profit margin, and the sons are also getting older uh, and getting ready to to establish lives of their own at that point in time. A lot of them move on. Robert moves on. Kenneth, uh, the next oldest son. He ends up going to Wilkes-Barre and establishes a small uh, coal crafting business there as well. But Harry L. and C. Egger continue working in the, uh, in the patient's workshop in West Piston. And that's, a, that's an arrangement that happens until Harry L. Has to, uh, is drafted into the United States military during World War II. So it's about 1942 he gets drafted and uh, there was a little bit of time while uh, he was in the military that Sieger was by himself. And it was during that time that Sieger really kind of grew and wanted to uh, expand beyond just crafting coal souvenirs. They had done uh, some other uh, commissioned pieces previously, uh, including uh, pieces of coal and, and an exhibit for the 1939 World's Fair. And that you know gave him the idea of you know allowing him to be a little bit more creative and he wanted to do that he wanted to do it really really bad but he couldn't really do it because he had family obligations at the time he couldn't really take that leap and try to do commissioned work because of his his young family so uh in 1943 Harry L is wounded at the battle of anzio and returns back to the workshop uh, with C. Edgar. And they continue uh, together uh, for some time. Some of the items that, uh, that they crafted uh, are necklaces and jewelry, but amongst the, the most prominent items that they crafted were the patient's hearts. So the patient's hearts were the brainchild of, of Harry B. And you can see them here. So in the center, we have a necklace that is on display at the Anthracite Heritage Museum that is made of anthracite coal and pyrite. The, so the fittings are, are pyrite. And uh, this was made by Sieger patients for his wife, Alice Marie. Now, Harry B was the one who kind of conceived the idea of the patient's heart because he needed to come up with something that set the uh, patient's workshop apart from other workshops. So the heart, if, uh, if you ever see a coal-shaped uh, heart, then it is most likely from the patient's workshop. However, uh, because it originated with Harry and all of the sons participated in this, we don't always know who crafted it. But the one in the center, the completed one, we do know that C. Egger was the one who crafted this, as well as the two uh, flanking them. So the two on the sides are not finished, but they uh, represent the different stages of the patient's heart. Some other items that we have in our collection uh, that the patient's workshop would have crafted. 
would have been uh, necklaces, bracelets, and earrings. And uh, so we have some earrings. We have a brooch down at the bottom photo. We have Sieger patients uh, kind of sitting next to his niece, Betty uh, Patients Claiborne. And she's actually wearing the necklace and earrings and probably the bracelet too, we can't really see her hand, but uh, that are pictured below. Other items that would have been crafted too were, were a little more functional too. So we have a pen set above, we have a candle holder, we have a uh, bowl and a souvenir uh, that basically says coal souvenir from Wilkes-Barre. So, it, and it's interesting to note too that the candle holder up top, and we have several others in the connect collection too, that uh, are actually shaped to look like tree trunks. And uh, it's, it's interesting to note that anthracite coal uh, actually originated from plant material trees uh, that uh, you know, kind of disintegrated and fossilized over millions and millions of years. So it's interesting that, that he, uh, he made those motifs uh, with the anthracite coal, that connection of the canola, uh, coal uh, history and formation. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the process of crafting coal. And uh, I'm going to talk about anthracite coal uh, very briefly. So anthracite coal is the hardest type of coal found on Earth. Uh, the majority of anthracite coal, over 50% today, is found in 484 square miles in northeastern Pennsylvania. So right where we sit, we have over 50% of the world's reserves right now. And uh, anthracite coal, as I said, is the hardest type of coal found uh, on Earth. It is 92% carbon on average and 8% volatile material and um, other impurities. Now, those impurities are, are really key to finding high quality coal. So the impurities include sulfur, uh, trace uh, mineral deposits such as iron, and, and other, um, you know, other impurities like dirt could get in between some of the seams as well. But uh, Seager patients wanted high quality coal. So when he looked for coal, he looked for uh, coal at, in Hazleton because the Hazleton area actually had a seam of coal called the Mammoth Vein. And the Mammoth Vein gets its name because it was the biggest vein, still is the biggest vein of anthracite coal uh, in the region. So most of the coals in the Wilkes-Barre Scranton area, the, the veins actually are anywhere from maybe a foot, 18 inches thick, up to five feet thick. The Mammoth Vein is anywhere from 13 to 25 feet thick. So he could find a very large chunk of coal uh, that was suitable for his sculpting needs. So I have some pieces of coal here I'm gonna to try to show you. So this is a piece of coal right here that uh, Seager patients probably would not have picked. So you can, I'm gonna turn it around. You can see that this is kind of, uh, kind of dirty. It's actually layered. So I'm gonna to try to get it close to my camera here, but it's actually a layered piece of coal. So there are maybe about uh, quarter inch layers that run across the entire piece of coal. And in between those layers are impurities, dirt, iron, and sulfur. And this piece of coal, I mean, I'm holding it right now and it's even, um, it's even flaking apart in my hand. So this would not have been an ideal piece for Seager patients because it would have broken up uh, too quickly and he wouldn't have been able to work with it. So some pieces of coal too also have this uh, iridescence and it. I don't know if you guys can see it quite right, but there's an iridescence right in here. Uh, this and one, you can do eight tens and 20 ones. It's up to you, buddy. Okay. So this is a uh, piece of peacock coal, and there's a little bit of this iridescence in here. It is uh, kind of a rainbow shaped, almost like uh, seeing oil in a in a puddle. That's that's the iridescence that you get 
out of the coal. And that's actually a natural formation because there is a little bit of oil that's embedded within this piece of coal. So you do get that rainbow iridescent effect. And Sea Edgar patients liked pieces like that because it gave um, you know, a multicoloration and another dimension to the coal that he worked with. But this piece of coal right here is probably the best type of coal that he would have worked with. It is a solid, really kind of clean uh, anthracite coal. So this was, would have been a, an example of the type of piece that he would have looked for. There are no cracks in it. You can turn it around. You can see there are no cracks in this piece of coal. And this would have been a piece that he could have worked with and sculpted uh, whatever he wanted to within the size limit, of course. He usually selected bigger pieces of coal, an appropriate size pieces of coal for his, uh, his item. So once he selected a piece of coal, uh, he had to craft it. And uh, right here on this slide, I actually do have um, four pieces of coal in the center photo that represent the various stages of crafting anthracite. So the upper left photo is a piece of coal that is raw coal. So what, what he would have done is he would have selected the piece of coal at, at the, uh, the mine site, brought it back to the, uh, the workshop. And usually the coal was, was not that shiny. Um, it was usually still dusty and dirty. So he would have to clean it off, uh, usually with water. I mean, well, that's how I clean this off too, is with water. And then uh, taking a small uh, brush and getting all the loose material that was off of it. So then he ended up with the piece that you see here that was kind of worked, it was cleaned, um, making it a little bit shinier, getting some of the dirt and dust off of it. So then he had to figure out what he wanted to do. So the end result of this is going to be a paperweight that you see in the lower right corner that says Cable for Coal New York. He would then take the raw piece of coal and the next step was to shape it. So in this case, uh, the bottom left photo has a piece of coal that he kind of cut the face off. So he trimmed the face so the face is nice and flat. He would have used a saw for this. And you can almost see the striations within that piece of coal where the saw blade went through and cut. And then he would have sanded it. And all, all four sides would have been sanded down. The rough edges would have been uh, taken away. So you know, when you're handling it, you won't get cut. And then the next stage would have been to polish it using a buffer. So the areas that he wanted to create a mirror-like shine, he would have polished it and polished it until it got that uh, mirror-like shine to it. And then finally, uh, he was able to put the graphic on the face as you see here. And usually how he did that, sometimes he had a stencil, uh, which he would use, uh, but sometimes he did it freehand. And uh, so the areas that are not polished, in this case, Cable for Coal New York, that area right there, he would have um, left that alone, but the other areas he would have used a small Dremel drill bit and he would have gotten in there and just lightly sanded that away. And he would have used sandpaper and a small Dremel bit to just score a little bit of that face off to get that, that roughness, that appropriate roughness. So you have that dichotomy between the polish and the, uh, the rough surface. And same thing with the, uh, the wording, the lettering was all done by hand as well. And uh, sometimes, like this is an example of a piece that he may have done for a coal company or a convention, and uh, maybe they wanted 10, 20, 30, 40 of these. But because he did it by hand, no two were exactly alike. So there's no two items from the patient's workshop that were ever exactly alike because everything was done by hand. Here's an example uh, that we have in our collection of a a template that he would have used, one of the stencils, okay? Uh, this actually came out of one of his toolboxes that we uh, we had donated to us by uh, Dr. Moss back in 2002. And uh, in 2005, 
we have uh, this breaker that is on display, uh, donated to us by his niece, Betty Patience Claiborne. And it's kind of neat to marry the two up because we have the template that he used to actually make this piece. So that's that's pretty cool, in my opinion. And uh, you can see where he placed the template on there and then sanded out where the windows were to rough it up. You can see where he removed the template and then wrote in DL and W LV cone cleaned with uh, with his Dremel bit by hand. He freehanded that. So you can see the process here and, and what he did. Some of the tools of his craft uh, that we have, you know, include one of his buffers and grinders that we see here. Uh, these came from his, uh, his workshop. And we can see, you know, him working in this photo in his workshop. Uh, he appears to be uh, grinding one of his tools, maybe sharpening it. And uh, there is a coal uh, carved ashtray sitting in the back. So it's, you know, 1950s, 1960s, the majority of people at that time did smoke. Uh, so selling a coal ashtray was probably a uh, in demand at that time. Hey, Juanita, uh, uh, Dr. Moss, I'm sorry. Do, would you mind talking about um, what you remember of, of your dad's workshop? It was dirty. Number <laughs> one, it was dirty. Yeah. So I, when I was just a kid, you know, I had to go and see my father about something like getting a nickel, stop at the candy shop on the way back to school. So I would open the door and the machinery was so loud and it was so dusty and I wouldn't go too far, but I would always yell. I could yell, daddy, daddy. And you hear me, he would come covered with coal dirt, coal dust, which he would breathe all those years. Now look, you see he has on a mask, but he, but he was not faithful with wearing a mask and it sort of tickles me a little bit because we are so masked up right now. And so it looks, looks perfectly normal to see someone in a mask. But back in those days, of course, people were not wearing masks, but he was supposed to wear a mask and he was in his shop breathing in all those small particles of coal dust, which actually did destroy his lungs in the end, sadly. So that's all I say. Yeah, the well, shop. Thank yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. So some of his finer tools uh, that we have in the collection, and I mean, I we have several hundred small tools uh, and I didn't really have the time to photograph all of them. But uh, so we do have up top some examples of his uh, drill bits that he would have used to, to grind away certain portions of his coal uh, carvings and sculptures. And uh, we do have a variety of small tools that were used for more detailed work. We do have actually a lot of small hammers and screwdrivers. We have a lot of small uh, gouges, just simple um, wooden sticks almost with, with needles on them for some of the finer detail. And uh, we do have actually some dental tools that he used to do more detail work, such as dental picks and seen here a dentist's mirror. And we have a photo of C. Edgar. Uh, you know, he does have safety goggles on and uh, he's actually, they're also probably magnifying the, uh, the item that he's working on so he can get the detail. And uh, he's using his, uh, his Dremel tool for that as well, which those bits would have been used in conjunction with. As I mentioned before, um, during the 1940s, during Harry's uh, absence, you know, he began to, to dream of, of bigger things. And um, that couldn't really happen because of financial and family obligations. He needed to earn a stable living so that uh, he could provide for his family. And, uh, but 1948, he married uh, Alice Marie Patterson. And uh, Alice Marie Patterson, her, her family, uh, from what I've read, uh, is actually one of the oldest African-American families in the Wyoming Valley, dating back to uh, the early 1800s. 
And um, she lived at 82 Loomis Street in Wilkesbury. And that was their family homestead. She lived there, went to school uh, at the Wilkesbury Public Schools. She went to college and became a nurse. During World War II, she joined the Women's Auxiliary Corps and became a, a second lieutenant uh, as a nurse. And uh, after World War II, she was discharged and then worked for Blue Cross of Northeastern Pennsylvania as the manager for their customer information center. And it was really that job that provided a, a stable um, income for the family and eventually led uh, you know, her and, and C. Egger to make the choice that C. Egger could go and pursue his artwork while, you know, she could kind of financially uh, sustain the family. So in 1950 or thereabouts, they uh, they moved from the West Pittston house into uh, Alice Marie's house at 82 Loomis Street in Wilkesbury, where C. Egger then uh, built his his new workplace okay out back so alice alice marie um she was one of Sieger patients's biggest uh what you could call fangirls i guess you could say at that time and uh, she was always rooting for him and in the late 1960s she wrote uh, a three-page pamphlet called black is indeed beautiful which uh, at the time was a play on the civil rights movement slogan of the 1960s, and also refers to the beauty of anthracite coal that Sieger Patience was trying to reveal. So the three-page brochure describes Sieger Patience's artwork, the transition from the souvenir business to that of an active artist, and in, in a little bit, uh, the impact on his family and, and his legacy. Later on in the 1990s, late 1990s, uh, she would also write a, another book called Bittersweet Memories of Home, which focuses more on her experiences as an African-American woman growing up in the Wyoming Valley and her subsequent marriage to Seager Patience. But on the cover is the house at 82 Loomis Street in Wilkesbury, the house where Seager Patience and Alice Marie uh, spent their, most of their marriage together. Now, Seager Patience passed away in 1972, and after he passed away, the uh, Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission bought some of his pieces. Okay. One of those pieces was uh, George Washington, and subsequent pieces were donated to the Anthracite Heritage Museum by uh, the descendants of Seager Patience over the years. So, of the notable of those items were his three presidents. Okay. So, although Patience was not active politically, uh, the events of the 1950s and 60s civil rights era did influence his art and inspired him to sculpt three presidents whom he thought expanded the civil liberties of American citizens. The Pennsylvania Anthracite Heritage Museum currently has the sculptures of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln in the collection. The sculpture of President John F. Kennedy is uh, still in a private collection. The sculpture of George Washington was purchased by the PHMC in 1972, and then subsequently um, transferred from the State Museum of Pennsylvania to the Anthracite Heritage Museum. So the sculptures of Washington and Lincoln were both sculpted from a single piece of anthracite coal. So this was a huge, huge piece of coal. Uh, and, and I know several years ago, I had to go and uh, and actually um, move George Washington from his exhibit case. And uh, it is very heavy. Uh, I would say this piece probably weighs about 80 to 120 pounds. Um, I'm not really a good judge of weight, but it is a very heavy, solid piece of coal. And uh, Washington's features in this are purposefully exaggerated. Uh, his shoulders, for example, were carved to be broad, signifying his burden of leading the United States through its infancy. And also on this slide, we do have an image of Seager Patience uh, adding some finishing touches to, uh, to George Washington before he's completing it. Now, the next piece uh, is a, the 
bust of Abraham Lincoln. This was donated in 2005 by Seager Patience's niece, Betty uh, Patience Claiborne. And it's essentially a two-piece uh, bust portrait of Abraham Lincoln. It consists of a base pedestal two inches high, and the bust itself is eight and three-eighths inches high. Most of the surface is polished with a dull blue black iridescent shine. So that, that peacock coal that I had uh, shown you before, uh, where you could see some of that rainbow iridescence, that's what this uh, entire piece is made out of. It doesn't show up too well in the photograph, but if you were to look at it uh, on exhibit, you could see the, uh, the blue and the yellow uh, and some of the greens coming through uh, the coal as well. So, there are certain areas that are were not buffed. Uh, they include his hair, shirt, and lower back. The pedestal itself, um, we have it inset into a, a stand right now, but the pedestal is rounded with varying sized uh, lines, and the bust sits in this pedestal. Lincoln faces left with his head slightly turned, and the details are carved in his face. He is bearded and has a full head of hair, and he's working a, uh, a double-breasted jacket with four large buttons, a vest with two buttons, and a short collared shirt and a thin tie. And the bottom of the pedestal actually has a green felt adhered to it so that uh, when standing, uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't damage uh, anything or be damaged by anything. So another piece that we have, this was, uh, is Amalurie's. So this is a piece that uh, you know, was really kind of close to Sieger's heart, uh, reflects um, matters uh, such as family and his African-American culture. So Emma Larice is a uh, depiction of an African-American woman with long hair and her hair portion is left unpolished and the face uh, is matte finished and forms a V at the neck. Emma Larice, the name means a uh, meek one, uh, according to Sieger Patience. And he wanted it, you know, it kind of reminded him of a biblical proverb, the meek shall inherit the earth. And it's a combination there of, of uh, Alice Marie, his wife's name. And a lot of people think that this piece is actually a depiction of Alice Marie Patience. But uh, I guess... Sieger insisted that it, it was not. Uh, it was just a general depiction of an African-American woman. We do have uh, several other sculptures. Uh, these uh, two African busts were sculpted by patients in the 1960s. The two busts, one female, one male, uh, like Emma Larice, reveal patients' desire to understand and claim his African heritage. Patient highlights his African culture through the head, traditional headdress and earring on the women. Both sculptures demonstrate Patience's talents at conveying humanity through his artwork. We also have a piece here. This was Colville, purchased in 1972. And this piece really reflects his, uh, his anthracite roots uh, to, the, to the area. And um, Patience can be seen working on Colville in the photo. And if you look kind of closely, he's also using a dentist pick for some of the finer details. So he worked on Colville in his spare time, and it remains his, his only known significant work that was unfinished. So from 1950 to 1972, just to name a few, he did carve pieces for Queen Julian of the Netherlands, the government of Barbados, Presidents Lyndon Johnson and R Richard Nixon, as well as uh, several museums like the Smithsonian, uh, churches, etc. And the pressures of commissioned pieces uh, added some stress to, to uh, the patient's career because some of them did have timelines uh, that he had to complete these by. However, as a way to decompress, patients occasionally took the time to work on Colville as a hobby. So he spent nearly 25 years working on Colville, and it was really a labor of love for him and symbolized his pride in the region's mining heritage. Within the sculpture are various vignettes of everyday mining scenes throughout the region. And I'll be honest with you, every time I look at Colville, I always see something new. Um, there's, there's a lot going on in Colville. So I'm gonna just describe some of these scenes uh, as, as you can see them right here. 
So in the upper left, there's a uh, carving of an anthracite breaker. Uh, the breaker is where the coal was processed into marketable sizes. And uh, Patience not only mimics the form of the breaker, but adds subtle features such as windows. There's some coal pockets there. There's even coal cars. There's a small uh, coal locomotive in the scene, as well as a truck and a road as well. So there's a lot going on just, just at the breaker there, a lot of detail within this, uh, this small little vignette. Just uh, below the breaker on the top of Colville is the signature, which reads Colville PA CPE. So when Seager Patients uh, signed his artwork, he often signed it in a monogram, CPE. And below that, we do have a series of carved linear rectangles that represent workers' housings in a patch town. So the image on the left uh, represents this, uh, this patch town almost from an aerial perspective. And uh, the area also has smooth uh, portions around the house rows, which represent roadways that would have connected the various houses and towns together. And uh, some of the, it, and I couldn't quite get the detail on this uh, with the camera that we have here, but if you look really closely on some of those houses, you can actually see uh, small windows and doors that he started to carve in. Not all of them have them, but uh, there are actually small uh, windows and doors that he started to carve in. And there's also small outbuildings behind some of the houses as well. So once again, a lot of detail, uh, which represents his skill. Now on the front, uh, the next image represents a relief carving of a drag line and strip mining operation. So by the time Seager patients started carving Colville in the 1940s, 50s, uh, strip mining actually became more common. Uh, and actually today, it's, it's the most common form of anthracite mining. So strip mining would have been a common scene for even uh, Seager patients at that time and other people who lived in this region. So patients carved the drag line first on top of the pit wall with the boom extended over the pit. You can see the, the boom is, is actually going down into the pit and is scooping up a load of coal. Below, oddly enough, below the, uh, the drag line uh, vignette is another relief carving that is uh, really not quite finished yet, but it's a relief carving of an area cityscape. And there is about 10 to 12 um, multi-story buildings that he had started carving out. Some of the buildings have um, definitive shapes some of them have windows and doors. Others, uh, you can tell that he was just starting to, to kind of shape them together. But really the, the most unfinished side is the right side. And that's illustrated in the next image. So on the right side of Colville is an underground mining scene. It uh, has a close up, reveals a relief carving of two miners working a seam of coal. Above them is a smaller relief of a miner working a seam of coal with a coal car nearby. I'm going to see if I could kind of zoom in, and I hope you guys can see this. Uh, did that make it better? Can you see the zoom here? So you can see the relief carving of the two miners here working. One has a uh, jackhammer, it looks like. He's going into the, uh, the coal seam. The other one has a pick uh, above him. There is a coal miner over here. And uh, he is uh, standing what, ne next to a coal car. Maybe he's going to be loading coal into that coal car. And then uh, down at the bottom, there's actually, uh, he actually bore a hole into the coal to represent a coal mine. And uh, you can see coal cars, loaded coal cars coming out of that mine. So once again, uh, an incredible amount of detail. All of these probably measure anywhere from uh, about an eighth of an inch high to, uh, in this case, maybe about an inch high. So to get that amount of detail within uh, that such a small space, that, that requires a lot of skill.
Now, some I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of his items that were are not in our collection, but are still significant to the work of C. Edgar Patience, most notably the altar at King's College and uh, the monolith that uh, is currently at the Smithsonian. So the altar at King's College, uh, pictured here on the left, and you can see C. Edgar Patience down at the bottom, uh, putting some finishing touches on it after it was put in place. This altar weighs uh, 4,200 pounds, and it took uh, patients about a year to design and sculpt, which he did at the Wanamie Colliery near Nanakoke, PA. Uh, it was dedicated to King's College on October 21st, 1956, and was funded by the children of John B. Corgan as a memorial to those who worked in the coal mines to provide an education for their children. The monolith, and we see Seager patients here on the right working on the monolith. He's uh, He's already smoothed the top portion of it and polished it. Uh, he has a hammer and a chisel, so he's taking little bits off the side here and there uh, to kind of shape it up uh, as he sees fit. But the monolith uh, at, for the Smithsonian was really sculpted for the Smithsonian's Hall of Coal within the Museum of History and Technology. And it weighs nearly 7,000 pounds. So that's, that's three and a half tons. That is a, a huge piece, and I believe it's the largest um, anthracite coal sculpture uh, out there. At least it's the heaviest anthracite coal sculpture out there. The top uh, was sanded and buffed to a mirror-like shine, while the sides remained natural to reflect what it would look like in the mine. And in 1961, it was transported to Washington, D.C. for the exhibit but unfortunately it was never put on exhibit. And uh, even to this day, it remains uh, actually in storage in Maryland. Other items in, uh, other Seager patients items in local collections include uh, this commemorative piece at the National Canal Museum. And uh, most recently, a, uh, a donation to the Smithsonian's National Museum of African-American History and Culture um, from Dr. Juanita Patience Moss and the descendants of Seager Patience. So you can actually go online and uh, and to the Smithsonian Institute and search for uh, items in that collection, and you can actually see them firsthand. Uh, I have included the link and the accession number here, as well as the uh, donation credit. But uh, we're also doing the same thing, by the way. Um, the PHMC has. Uh, a database that is now on our website. And uh, a lot of Seager patients' pieces are now on online. So people can go to the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission website. You can search uh, our collections, that's the tab. And you can search by museum. Uh, you can type in Anthracite Heritage Museum, you can type in Seager patients, and uh, you can find uh, the artwork that I'm describing today as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about conservation. And uh, so it was really important for Seager patients to uh, find the right type of coal, high quality coal with a minimal amount of impurities. Unfortunately, all anthracite coal, no matter how, um, how little the impurities are in it, how little sulfur and, uh, and iron and, and things like that are in it, um, it tends to break apart as soon as, well, within a reasonable amount of time of being on the surface. And a lot of that's because of humidity. So anthracite coal comes out of the surface, you know, it's, it's under pressure underground for so many years, comes to the surface, it loses that pressure, it gains, um, it starts to crack and cleave apart. The impurities attract moisture, which further complicate those cracks and uh, they actually cause the coal to do a thing called popping. And the coal actually does pop. So little, little flecks of, of coal will just pop off uh, periodically. And uh, that's something that, you know, once items get donated to us, we have to keep, uh, keep an eye on. So we can't keep them in a very humid uh, condition. Ideally between 45 and 55% humidity is where we keep them. But, it's also that lack of pressure that causes them to crack. So most recently, we've had uh, three of our sculptures uh, conserved. We had the Lincoln sculpture conserved in 2014. 
we had Colville and Emma Larice conserved in 2021. And um, you can see the image on the left has Colville. And there was a crack that extended from the breaker uh, right through the little patch town. And I'm gonna try to get my uh, pointer out here so you guys can see where I'm going. So you can see there's a crack here, kind of goes along this way that developed. And it was a pretty significant crack that had developed. Um, and we were at risk of actually losing um, that portion of Colville if we did not act quickly. So um, we contacted a conservator and the conservator treated it just like he treated Emma Reese and, and Lincoln. And Lincoln, you can see here, also had a very large crack that ran from his shoulder uh, right across the uh, the chest and down to his lower right waist. And we, we were really afraid that uh, if it got any worse, then the whole sculpture would just crack apart. So uh, we had to act quickly on that as well. And um, But by getting them conserved, uh, the conservators, you know, they use the same uh, method for any type of coal sculpture. So what they do is they clean any residue away from the cracks. Uh, so usually a residue builds up dust and grime over the years, it's kind of natural. So they clean that up, they, uh, they buff that away. Any loose uh, pieces around the cracks, they actually, um, they chip them away. Uh, and then what they do is they mix this epoxy solution and put some coal dust in it. To, uh, to mimic the coloration of the anthracite. And then using a, uh, a syringe or like a hypodermic needle, a very thin hypodermic needle, they inject the cracks with that epoxy. And it does two things. The epoxy um, seals the crack, so it doesn't allow any moisture into the crack once it dries. And it also um, melds the two uh, halves of the crack together and prevents them from from splitting apart. So it also acts as a glue. And uh, so that's how they, they conserved those two pieces and Amala Reese most recently. And we also have uh, cases, special cases that we built for our, uh, all of our coal sculptures that actually monitor uh, and keep a steady temperature and humidity for us. Sometimes things don't don't always work out the way they should, though. Um, one thing is the uh, the altar at King's College, most notably, uh, it received some damage in the the 1990s, and uh, the first, I guess, the top of the altar started to to crack and began to disintegrate, and then the uh, the sides and the face started to uh, to cleave and crack and disintegrate. Now this is in a in a, um, in a chapel at King's College down in Wilkes-Barre. And uh, at the bottom, we have the original photos of the original here. So uh, Seager Patience is working on, uh, on putting finishing touches there. We have an example of his original motto that he sculpted in, on, on the front, and that's what he's working on. And unfortunately, in the mid 90s, um, it started breaking apart. So another coal sculptor at the time, Frank Magdalinski, was requested to come in to do repairs. And uh, he was not able to, uh, to salvage a lot of, of the facing. So what he had to do is really chip away some of the facing. Uh, the, the top, he had to kind of carve that away too. And you can see the top in the upper image is actually a, uh, a marble top now and not anthracite coal. And then he had to chisel away the front and the sides, evening that out. Uh, then he used plywood as a plywood backing to the core portion of the altar. And then he would face that plywood with bits of anthracite coal. So there you get this uh, two different looks um, you know, from the restored version to the original version. And you can see Frank also had to remake as best he could the, uh, with the intent of mimicking Seager Patience's uh, motto in the center. 
So on June 7th, 1972, Sager patients passed away, complications from black lung. The very coal that he beautified and loved had ironically contributed to his death. And Sager patients was one of the last anthracite coal sculptors, reaching his peak when the industry was beginning its decline. And despite the uh, decline of the industry, he gave a new life to anthracite and showed the world the beauty of anthracite coal through his artistic expression. His carvings and sculptures are found in museums throughout the country, including the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of African American History and Culture, Pennsylvania State Museum, Pennsylvania Anthracite Heritage Museum, the National Canal Museum, and uh, I do believe there is a piece actually at the Luzerne County Historical Society. Um, so that way, his artwork is being commemorated. Uh, millions of people uh, get to see his artwork every year and learn from him and understand uh, his, his dream of, you know, the beauty of anthracite coal. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, John. That was very good. Uh, We've got a couple of questions in so far. If you have more questions, you could punch them into the chat. Um, the first one's easy one. I can answer it. The King's College altar is, uh, it is accessible to the public. They've actually just renewed, it was the old uh, Memorial Chapel on North Street. They've restored that. That is their uh, current chapel. I know they have Sunday Mass, late Sunday Mass, like 7 o'clock, 7.30 for the students but they also do a number of events there for the public. You can actually, um, they make it available to nonprofits and different community groups. And so you can actually get in there and see the restored altar in the chapel. Um, another one, John, uh, how many, well, which items, uh, which pieces are currently on display at the anthracite? I mean, we, as you said, we do have one. We currently don't have ours on display just because we have uh, the artwork of Jacob Sist up now currently, but are there uh, any of Mr. Patience's works currently in the Anthracite Museum? Uh, yeah, we, we do have uh, a number of them on permanent display uh, in our main gallery. So we have uh, Lincoln, Washington, we've got Amala Reese, we have Colville, they're all on exhibit. Uh, our museum entrance also has a uh, 350 pound monolith that uh, he carved. And uh, that is a, an abstract uh, piece of coal. I didn't highlight that in my presentation, but uh, that's the first thing you see when you walk into our exhibit hall is a, a piece from C. Edgar Patients. Uh, we do have a number of smaller pieces on exhibit, including the two, um, the two busts, uh, the female African-American female bust and the, uh, the African male bust on exhibit, as well as some of his uh, souvenir uh, jewelry and um, you know, the bowl and things like that we have on display as well. Um, you had mentioned his monogram earlier. Did he sign all of his pieces or just maybe the larger ones or? Um, he, he signed, yeah, he signed, he did not sign all of his pieces. So um, the ones that we have that he signed, there's uh, Lincoln, uh, Amala Reese, there's a small uh, monogram on that, Colville, the monolith actually at the beginning of our exhibit hall, he signed. And um, trying to think, did I say Washington? I don't remember. Yeah, if I did. You said Lincoln. I don't know if you said Washington. Yeah, so Washington. Yeah, he signed those. So the smaller ones he usually didn't sign, and of course the souvenirs he he didn't sign either. I'm just looking through to see if I missed any questions. I think that might be all of them right now. Um, well, I definitely uh, want to thank you, uh, John. You obviously put a lot of time and a lot of research into the presentation. I learned a lot today. I know our uh, viewers did too. And uh, like I said, we're going to have this, we're still recording it. We're going to have this up on YouTube and we're going to give it to the Anthracite Museum. And by all means, if you need any additional information, you can contact us. We have some research information available in our library. Uh, the Anthracite Museum, of course, has a, a lot more three-dimensional objects. They also have a research library. 
or uh, we can put you in touch with uh, Dr. Moss, uh, you know, via the books, or uh, we can get you uh, in touch with her if you need to do a little bit more research. So if there's, you know, anything else, if this whetted your appetite, your curiosity for this evening, uh, there's certainly different places you can go to get more information. Uh, yes, the recording is going to be made available hopefully tomorrow, if not tomorrow, uh, Thursday. Just need a little bit of light editing. Uh, it will be on YouTube. We'll have the links on our website. Uh, it'll be a few different other places. Uh, we'll have it on Facebook as well. So uh, just keep following us and you'll be able to you'll be able to find it. Don't worry. <laughs>